So one of the very first things that you guys should do as soon as you open up UFT and you're ready to work on a project is you come to this test settings menu and you configure everything the way you need so that afterwards you don't have to touch the settings and all of your tests will function the same. So let's go ahead and look at the next pane, which is this run option. And in here, we have these data table iterations where we can select how we want our script to iterate through the data table. We can run for one iteration only. We can run on all rows. So if you have multiple rows of data, for example, you know, the first row contains first name, last name, and password, let's say. And then the next row contains a different first name, last name, and password. And you're data driving your test. You can just have a few lines of code. You can parameterize that data. And so you can say run on all rows. And then that test will run multiple iterations having a very few lines of code. I will actually show you guys that when we get closer to the test case development stage, as soon as we're done with all this introductory knowledge. And then you can run on a specific set of rows. Again, I'll show you guys that. The other very important thing to note here is how do you want QTP to handle errors, right? Let's say there's a logical error. Well, logical errors are those made by you and everything is syntactically correct, but the logic is incorrect. So it won't apply here. But if there's something like a runtime error or a compiler error, how do you want QTP to tell you? Do you want it to tell you with a pop-up message box? Do you want it to proceed to the next action iteration? So it will skip whatever happened and it'll go to the next iteration. It will stop the run or it will just proceed to the next line of code and won't worry about it. These are very important settings. And when you guys are designing a keyword driven framework, you want to export these into a VP script and then you want to configure them externally. So if you're debugging, for example, maybe you'll turn on pop-up message boxes so that you'll see the errors. If you're not debugging and you're in production and your code is running, maybe you want to proceed to the next step so that if you have a suite of 300 test cases, test case number two doesn't hold up the other 298 if it breaks. Another thing that you can do here, guys, is set the object synchronization timeout. So this is how long UFT will wait for an object to appear before it says, no, that's it, the object failed. And you guys may see that as we develop some tests. The other very important thing here is to disable smart identification during the run session. Smart identification is a very important topic in UFT. It has to do with object recognition that UFT does for you. Remember when we do the recordings? UFT somehow recognizes all those objects and it has some native ways that it does that, which we will go through. But my recommendation is as soon as you open up UFT, you come here, click disable smart identification. It's gonna screw you up. And the final option that you have is you can save images to desktops when errors occur. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit apply here because I made a change and we will move on to the next tab.